Hey, hello everyone. This is criminal profiler, Pat Brown. And I want to thank everyone who's coming to the live for actually being here at this time, because I sent out the messages that it was at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And, uh, but then I, some idiot, I don't know who, um, somehow put in 7 p.m. <laughs> so it showed up on YouTube at 7 p.m. <clears throat> I don't know who that was, but you know, me and things that go wrong. I have to do that every time. So anyway, welcome everybody who is in the chat room. I think I've welcomed everybody, but if I haven't so far, welcome. And um, ah, yes, I'm glad you're here because this is a really interesting case that I was requested to do. And I did send out a message to all my patrons and say, what do you want me to do this week? And I've got a whole great list of new stuff. A couple of them I'm going to do at the Hangout this week and others I'm going to do a full show on. But today I really wanted to do this one. Uh, because it had so many interesting elements to it. And that when I do uh, full shows, it ha there has to be something more than just a story. I have to be able to analyze something and find something interesting to analyze. This is one of those shows. Uh, but just before I start, uh, please uh, do, if you'd like to be a part of the, the um, chat room, please do join Patreon. The link is below in the description. It's five bucks a month supports an educational channel and you get to come to eight lives. That means four uh, case case shows a month and four hangouts a month. And it's very helpful. Uh, if you, you don't have to do that, you can please just subscribe to the channel, like hit the bell for notifications. This also helps in the algorithm. And believe me, when you don't have a million subscribers, you need a little bit of help. <laughs> you can also buy one of the books below, click the little money sign and so on and so forth. Uh, this show, Hopefully, um, we'll not have any problems with uh, monetization, but um, sometimes you get weird things that happen. So I'll let you know if that does happen to me in this show. All right. So, all right. So new people are coming in. Sarah Adams is also here. Uh, and Lex is here. And okay, let's get to this. This case, his name is Madison Holton. And there were two shows done about this case um, on two different, um, there was a, uh, let me, let me let me show you where they were done. And this, I want to point out some very important things about when you try to get information about a case is where you're getting information from. Uh, these are the two shows, all right? This was a Dateline show. It's called 11 Minutes. It's about 45 minutes long. Uh, then there was a, a show, uh, you can now go over to Peacock. Uh, I'll, put all, I'll put the information in the description below. It's called American Monster, Two Families, and it's about an hour and a half long. This one has a lot more information about the entire the history of the families. This one, not so much. But each one of them has different stuff in there that I find rather fascinating. And they're, 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 um, they're put out five months between them. And I can't say which who filmed what first, okay? So this one came out earlier in the spring. This one came out five months later. Um, and I find differences between these two, which are fascinating to me. I actually don't know when they were produced, when people were interviewed. I have done shows which came out within weeks. I've done shows where I've forgotten I even did them. <laughs> and a few years later, somebody says, oh, you know, Pat, I saw you on this show. And I'm like, really? What show was it? I've forgotten. And it's because it was so long in sitting, sitting wherever it was sitting. So these are five months apart. This one came out first. I'm going to talk about this one, and I'm going to talk about this one. This one's first. Five months later, this comes out. And I see some interesting differences, but I just don't know the entire details behind it. So I'll explain that because when you go to watch documentaries, you have to understand they have agendas, they're highly edited, and you never know whether they're who they're who they're for and who they're against, <laughs> why they're doing what they do, just don't know. So always take everything with a grain of salt is what I'm trying to say. So those are the two documentaries, uh, which I will put in the description. I can't link them because one is on Peacock and the other is on ID uh, Investigation Discovery. And if you don't have those, you can't see them. So uh, but I will try to explain them here in case you don't have any access to those at all. So uh, well, you know, Sarah points out agenda driven. Everything in this world is agenda driven. And th this is one of the tricky things about trying to analyze anything, you know, even ourselves, because we're agenda driven too. 
You know, Pat Brown is agenda driven. Why do I have my YouTube channel? Is it because I'm trying to make money? Is it because I'm trying to, uh, who knows? <laughs> you know, people say all kinds of things about me, why I have a YouTube channel, why I was ever on television, why I was a criminal profile. So <laughs> we all have agendas in our lives. They're not necessarily bad agendas, but, and we often have multiple agendas. But so do, you know, uh, especially when you get into the media, they have a lot of agendas. And usually those agendas are making money and making money. <laughs> so, so it's very tricky. And that's one of the reasons I'm very reluctant to do many of these just documentaries anymore, because they often have agendas that are that end up with a knife in my back. So but. There are some good ones. And these were both very interesting. They were interesting. I'm going to describe this to you. So, <laughs> Lisa, you're so mean. <laughs> Is it because you like to hear yourself talk? <laughs> I've been accused of that. I've been accused of a lot of things. I, you know, yeah. Yeah. I, I, no, I'm, I'm a single woman. I live alone. So I'm so desperate. I just, I just got to come out here. And, all right. <laughs> we have we have to be amused uh, by things. All right. Let's get to the story. I guess that's what you're here for. All right. So this is Madison Holton. He's actually got a f different first name, but they call him Madison. All right. And the issue of this whole case is about the 11 minutes that the murders of these two people or the murder suicide, depending on which way we look at it, went down. OK. And. Did he have anything to do with it or not? And one of the things you're going to notice, even with the two pictures I put up, because I have an agenda, I want to show you, when you look at this picture, I'm going to say, you think he's kind of creepy, and you think he could have done it. You look at this picture, and you go, oh, he looks like a nice boy. I don't think he did it. You see, that's just still photos, and they don't necessarily mean anything, but when they're used, they convey an idea. And the idea may not be accurate, but they convey the idea anyway. So it gets very tricky. And the same thing is true in, in when you're doing the documentaries. They present things in a way that are intended to have you look a certain direction. Sometimes they want to misdirect you for half the documentary and they go, surprise, and then they go a different direction. That's sometimes just drama stuff. Other times they do have an agenda behind it as to who to they want you to view the uh, whole story in a certain way. They want you to believe a person is innocent or the person is guilty. So depending on which makes more money. <laughs> so that's usually the whole issue. All right. So um, let's see what you have to say here. 11 minutes on Dateline, 13 minutes on Netflix. What? There's not 13. There's 13 minutes on Netflix. I don't know about that one. All right. Um, well, he's got two fingers up. No, no. He's got... <laughs> he's got Two fingers. Mind you, there was another point in his um, uh, in his interrogation where he did use one finger. But this was actually two fingers. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <clears throat> Hopefully that doesn't get me canceled right here. All right. Let's go. And let me tell you the basic story. And there are so many interesting details in what could have happened in this story, which is why I find it as a profiler very fascinating. All right. Jesse, that's his real first name. Jesse. Madison Holton says he, this is, oh, by the way, this is coming off of heavy.com. I always like to tell you where I get my, whatever reporting I get, <laughs> just so you can hear the story in a quick way. And it's from heavy. Uh, Wikipedia doesn't have him in there. All right. Jesse Madison Holton says he's lived an unimaginable nightmare. Police suspected him of murdering both of his parents, April Holton and Mike Holton. Uh, he was the former mayor of a town called Eclectic in Alabama. It's a very strange name for a town. It's really weird. But anyway, it's true. Okay, let me let me show you the town in Alabama. Um, it is a very, very small town. And this has some level of um, influence on maybe what happened in this case. The sheriff's department, the DA, and all this kind of thing. Very small town. And, and Mike, the father... Um, he had been a paramedic, a firefighter, and became the mayor of this town. So very well-liked fellow. Um, he and his wife 
according to both documentaries, especially the the one done by uh, Investigation Discovery, talk about how they fell in love, like right at the end of high school, happy couple, had three kids, just lived the perfect life. Um, but somewhere during the time when he was a um, uh, paramedic firefighter, he injured his back. And because he injured his back, he started taking tramadol um, for the pain. And that sent him on a spiral down where he was under the influence of certain types of drugs um, in order to keep going, to keep his job. And um, supposedly had it caused some personality changes and also he spent a lot of money. So eventually, this is the story. Now, mind you, this is the story. These two people are dead, all right? He could tell the story. His younger brothers could tell the story. He's got two twin younger brothers who never appeared in either documentary, which is interesting in itself. And then you have her family and you have his family telling pieces of stories. Understand, we don't know how accurate any of this stuff is. They did have a problem in their marriage. This we know because they separated. Uh, they lost the house supposedly due to the fact he spent too much money trying to get medication for his pain. But I don't know if that's true. But they lost the house. And then they moved into a, um, supposedly they were in this really cute house. And then they moved into this, let me see if I can find a picture of it. Uh, okay, hold on. I've lost my picture of the house. Um, oh, I've already started losing pictures. No, nope, but it's not there. Where's my picture of my house? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Okay, this picture. They, they moved into a, no, uh, what do you call these things? Um, modular homes. Uh, so people used to call them trailer homes, but they're like too, too wide. And they, they, they can be very nice inside. But they moved here and she wasn't happy about it. And then they split. She went and lived someplace else. He continued living here. And his son, his son Madison, came and stayed with him. Why? Because son Madison was living with his mom and the two other kids, the two younger brothers, and was apparently doing drugs. And she hated drugs because she came from a family who fell apart because of drugs. And she was raised in foster homes and such. And she was so happy with him until he started into supposedly a drug spiral downhill. So she, when he started getting into it, she's like, yeah, I'm done. You can't be in the house. If I have to pick I got three kids and I can't let you do this because you're going to influence the other kids. So she sent him over to live with dad in that double that modular home, whatever you call it. So he's now living with dad. All right. And this is where the, the crime ends up happening was at dad's home. Now, again, I don't know all the details of a failing marriage. Um, everybody's got a story, you know, my, you know, one person's story, the other person's story, and everybody else's story. And we don't know where the truth lies because people tell different stories depending on what they want to accomplish with those stories. So I just, I, I leave it at this. We know they were separated. She supposedly had begun seeing somebody else and he was not happy about it. And that is an important part of the story. And therefore he, my, my, by the way, supposedly growing up, he was, a handful, shall we say? I don't know what a handful means because that could mean a personality disorder from a very young age. He was difficult. And now he was a teenager who was supposedly he went with the wrong gang as, you know, blame the gang, not the child choosing the gang. But he went with the gang, started doing lots of drugs. So the story of the day that go, everything went badly is that he was staying with his dad. His dad came home and found his house essentially trashed. Because while dad was at work, Madison had a bunch of guys over and they're smoking weed and they're doing drugs and the whole place is a flaming wreck, complete trash of drug use and bad behavior. Now, that's gonna piss off dad. And this is what set the whole thing in motion. When he found that out, it wasn't just that he found that out. It's that one of the parents of another child called up mom and said, hey, your son had his drug party at this house, at, at your dad, at, at your ex or separated husband's house, whatever. And then she called him too. So, so it, there was a complaint. So he decided to take some action because he was frustrated. She was frustrated. So she came over to the house. So they were there together. 
And this is where the, the, the very strange story starts. Um, so, all right. Now, let me read you just what happens here. Now, the claim is this. All right. So he maintains that. Uh, so what happened was he comes, he's over there with his mom and dad. And I'm going to give you some very interesting details as we go along later, which I consider evidence. But I just want to give you a basic story. All right. So he was 17 years old at the time. He was charged as an adult with the slayings of his mother and his father. But the charges were later dismissed. And this is going to be a very interesting issue about why they were dismissed. The teen is often simply called Madison Holton. His dad's first name was technically Jesse, too. So that's why it's called Madison. He, in turn, maintains that his father murdered his mother and then took his own life. All right. So he that says here is Holton's going to tell a story on Dateline. Uh, the shootings occurred on September 11, 2016, when he was 17 years old. The charges were dropped in fall 2018 after he had spent more than a year in jail. He couldn't, they gave like a million dollar bond and, he, and nobody could come up with that kind of money. So he spent, a 17 year old kid, he spent over a year in jail awaiting trial. Now, the, the bizarre thing happened with the trial was that when the trial date came up, they were like arriving at court, the DA dropped the charges and said, we're not going to pursue, which is so rare. That's like, what? So they dropped the charges. He became a free man. And he has gone on since. Um, he's gotten married. He's joined the army. He's over in Germany. At least that's what I can read about. Um, and he's done a couple of documentaries um, talking about his innocence. And the, and the sheriff has shown up in those documentaries claiming he thinks he still did it. And so we have you know, the usual documentary stuff. Now, he says, I have no doubt in my mind that the sheriff will try to put him back in jail. Why is this? It's because it's not double jeopardy. He never went to court. They dropped the charges because they said there was a concern that there would be too much reasonable doubt. And the DI didn't want to lose a case, essentially. So they dropped it. Doesn't mean they can't go to court because it, it, he never was in court. So he says, the sheriff will try to put me back in jail. I don't know why he has such a grudge against me. Uh, the sheriff doesn't have a grudge against him. The sheriff believes the evidence says he did it. Is the, ev is the sheriff correct? Well, that's the question. Now, he, Holton says, um, he told the sheriff he thinks, um, he told the sheriff, he, no, wait, wait, hold on a second. Let me try to read this very poorly written statement. He was told the sheriff thinks he committed murder, but he said he will think wrong for the rest of his life. He says, I'm innocent and the sheriff is just going to be wrong forever. All right. According to Dateline, that's one of the documentaries, Mike Holton had a drug problem and narcotics in his system on the night and the night. And he did, although his behavior was not obvious of any narcotics. And I'll get into that. In addition, the parents were undergoing a divorce. That is true. Um, and she was seeing somebody and he was very unhappy about that. And I'll get into the issues of his, he was obviously depressed about his wife moving on. Mike's diaries, which there were, indicated a man who felt like he couldn't go on without his marriage. And so this is the key to the defense is that he was severely depressed. He didn't want to lose his wife. And he left these diaries that said, I can't basically live without you kind of thing. So that's very interesting and definitely plays into, is this guy guilty or is this guy guilty? Now, they pretty much excluded the, the, uh, the wife. Um, there are a few people who managed to put her in the picture as shooting him first. And then somehow before he killed over, he shot her. <laughs> but it doesn't really work. So in other words, she was a 100% victim. The question comes down to is which one of them pulled the trigger on him? Did he pull the trigger on himself? Or did he pull the trigger on him? And the other question is, there's three choices. And the DA does put these three choices out. Either he killed his wife and then himself. Or he saw his dad killing his mom and killed only his dad. Or he killed both his mom and his dad. Three choices. Okay. That's where this is. It's still an unsolved case. It's still not being prosecuted. He's moved on with his life. And can he, which is, must be a very, very horrifying thing. 
you know, he's moved on. He's in, he's in the army and he's married. And yet hanging over his head forever is the possibility that the sheriff and the new DA or whoever comes into town can go, go show up at his doorstep and arrest him and say, now we're prosecuting. That's a hell of a thing to live with. So that's kind of, kind of horrifying. So that's what he's living with. Um, that he never knows because it's not double jeopardy. So it's not like they can't take him to court. They can, they can take, they can't take him to court because he's dead. So, you know, so if it's him or if it's him, they can't take him to court, but they can take him to court. So there's where we end up in a very interesting situation. So, all right. All right. So let's go on to what happened that day, because this is where it gets so very interesting. So, so essentially, Madison, go, while dad's at work, trashes the house with a bunch of friends and, and does a lot of drugs. Now, you will see, one of the things you'll see in this, uh, in this case is what you think of Madison. Um, sorry, let me find Madison. Here we go. Um, in the Dateline production, you see him being presented in a much worse way than you see him presented in the investigation discovery documentary. Um, so like, let me, let me show you a couple of pictures from the, the, the Dateline one. And he didn't come off as well in Dateline. I, 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 that's the earlier one. I don't know whether it was edited that way or whether he learned something from doing that when he got, did better the next time. I just don't know because this, there is no way to know, but I want to show you a couple of pictures of, of um, Madison, just because it shows you how we can be very um, swayed by the by a person's looks. Now, here is a picture of him right after it happened. And when you look at this kid, you say, damn, I think he killed his parents because he looks like kind of a creepo. <laughs> Check him out in court. He still looks like a creepo. He does. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to like him. But here he is in the Investigation Discovery Channel. And he's quite lovely looking. And he speaks very well. And here he is reading the Bible. He's very involved in church. And here he is. He's a nice looking man. And he speaks very well. So which guy is he? Is he a creepo psychopath that we see in certain 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 parts of the shows? Or is he not a, just a just a kid who did stupid stuff? because he was angry that his parents were getting divorced. His dad was supposedly supposedly doing drugs. Um, and when I say that, I say he took drugs, but the doctor gave him, but there's claims that he, the dad made him go buy drugs because he was hanging around druggies. So I don't know the truth of that, but his dad's try, trying to keep paying down by doing drugs, maybe addicted. He's doing lots of drugs. Is he, is he just being a stupid 17 year old who went, who kind of just was a jackass kid? Uh, angry at the world, angry at his parents for breaking up and all the stuff that went on. Or is it dude a psychopath? And there is no way, I'm going to say that, even as a profiler, there's no way I can tell you absolutely. I'd be lying if I did that. I can't tell you because I'm only seeing flashes of this guy in different circumstances. And believe you me, I have been, <laughs> I have been, I've had photos taken of me, which are very unflattering, shall we say. Um, and it makes me look one way or the other. I can, <laughs> or, or <laughs> whatever it is, you know, you especially take a video and you're moving around a lot like I do. And so here's a nice shot. And then, <laughs> and then I, you know, I've been, I've had those show up. She's crazy. She's insane. She's this, she's that. So I'm, very suspicious of still photos. I am. And moments in time. However, some of them are concerning. Okay. And, and that please become concerned when they're right there during the investigation, when they see things, they're like, not stuff they've seen on a documentary, but stuff they've seen in front of, they become concerned about certain things and that can sway them one direction or the other. So I just want to point that out. All right. So let's look at the day that this start stuff started going down. So what essentially happened was, so Madison decides to throw a party at, at dad's house and trash the living heck out of it. Now, 
this shows a couple of things. One is he's out of control. Two is that he's very disrespectful of his father. Whether he hates his father or whether he just doesn't think his father doesn't matter. Um, he's already been thrown out of his mother's house. So maybe he's like, screw both of you. And he's just doing what he's going to do. Well, dad comes home. Dad and mom both hear about this problem. So dad comes home and he handcuffs his son. Right now. What, one something I asked myself when I heard about it, he handcuffed his son is first of all, it's kind of a tough love thing. He handcuffed his son and called and called the sheriff's department. So what he was trying to do is get it was a tough love, you know, scared straight kind of tactic. He was frustrated. Uh, the mom was frustrated. They both didn't know what to do with this kid. So he handcuffed his kid. His kid sitting on the sofa. That's when the sheriff's department arrived to talk to them about what was going on. Um, and what the question that immediately came to my head is, why does he have handcuffs? He's not a police officer. Now, my daughter is a police officer. She has handcuffs. But he's not a police officer. He's a mayor. He, well, he's resigned from being a mayor because his wife, apparently, this is a story, that because of his drug issues, uh, she forced him into resigning. Um, I don't know if that, I don't know the, the validity of all of that, but he was a paramedic, a firefighter, and a mayor. He was never a police officer. Why does he have handcuffs? Now, some of you will say, because he likes to do fun things with the handcuffs. I'm not going to get into that. Maybe he does, but why does he have handcuffs? And that's never answered. So one of the problems you have with documentaries a lot of times, and the reason it's so hard to analyze, and why you have to be careful when you do analyze, to be honest, shall we say, because we just don't have a lot of information. I do not have any idea what the crime scene actually looks like. I don't. Why? Because it's an open case. It's We see a little couple blurred visions uh, of the uh, crime scene, but I don't really actually know where the bodies actually were, what they're, what, what actually looked like at the crime scene. Uh, I don't have any access to the autopsy reports or the police reports, anything. I don't have access to that. So I'm I cannot base any of my analysis on those things because they don't exist. All right. So anyway, I don't know why he has the handcuffs. I'd like to have, I would have asked him that question. Dude, why do you have handcuffs? <laughs> Go on, kind of want to know. Are you a control freak? Are you some other reason you got them? I don't know. But anyway, he had them. So he handcuffed his son before the police arrived and then they arrived. Okay. So what happened here at this point was, According to Dateline, most daily, Madison threw a house party while his dad was at work. Michael Holton called the sheriff's department and a deputy came over to the home at the dad's request. The deputy reported that April was in the living room. So the mom came over and they were both there. They were calm. They were sitting there. He is sitting on the sofa with his hands behind his back in handcuffs. Uh, the deputy reported that uh, April was in the living room and Madison was, quote, sullen on the couch. Michael asked the deputy, quote, how are parents, how as parents could they get the juvenile courts involved? He told the deputy he found drug paraphernalia associated with the party. Um, and he was very upset the house had been trashed and he wanted to do something about it. All right. So the deputy uh, told them um, that, um, well, and this is a very important part that the deputy told them the next day they were to come in and they, were, they weren't going to arrest the son, but the next day he was going to go before a judge, bring a son and see what he could do about the, 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 uh, uh, the issues of his son's bad behavior. And this is going to play a very important part in what I think actually happened, but I'm going to just glaze over that for now. Okay. So the deputy leaves. All right. After the deputy leaves, Let's see if I can go see some here things here. Oh, hold on a second. So here's the house. Then we have, this is the room. Uh, this is the, where he was sitting on the couch. And here we have Madison showing how his hands were, were handcuffed behind his back. All right. Um, okay. I'm going to get into this now. A sheriff's investigator said that M Madison Holton, what, okay, let me go, go through the story that Madison Holton tells. So Madison is now, the, 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 the deputy leaves, okay? 
But there's something very interesting about what happens before the deputy, deputy leaves, and I'll get into that. But the deputy leaves, and this is where the 11 minutes comes in. He leaves the house. The parents are alive. Madison is got handcuffs behind his back. Here's what happens next. All right. He says he heard his parents fighting in the master bedroom. So in other words, he claims his parents came back in. Now, mind you, I'll get into this in a bit. Parents went out with the deputy. Then they came back in and went to the master bedroom and closed the door. At least that's what he says. He says, I jumped up and ran to the master bedroom. He hears her arguing, mom going, help, help. So he runs there. And okay, one of the things it doesn't say here is that he says that he kicked the door in because he got his hands behind his back, supposedly. Kicks the door in. There is no evidence that the door was actually kicked in. So, and, and, and it's interesting because, well, obviously if he's got hands behind his back, he's a little more trouble turning around trying to open the doorknob. So even if it wasn't locked, the door is just shut. He would have a wee bit of a problem, wouldn't he? But there was no evidence he actually kicked the door in. Whether it was so lightly connected that it didn't show any evidence of him kicking it in or he never kicked it in, we don't know. Um, I, I can't tell you. All right. I jumped up and ran to the master bedroom door and dad was like holding mom like this. Uh, and this is an important thing. So supposedly he's got mom and sort of a, at least, you know, arm bars, you know, thing. Um, not necessarily choking her, but just his arm around her. Um, and at this point, he does not mention any gun. Now, I, I thought I somewhere he mentioned a gun, but if you look later in his stuff, he's saying he doesn't have any clue that any gun was was there. So supposedly he's, mom, dad, dad is like holding his mom like this. She's saying, help, help. So uh, he said, I had the handcuffs on and I sprinted all the way to my neighbor's house, which wasn't that far, but it went to his neighbor's house. And I got them and they went to the house and found everything. Okay, so the, the neighbor called the police and then the neighbor went over there or the neighbor, uh, I'm gonna try, kind of think which way it was. Oh, he says he never heard a gunshot. Now, both of them were shot. He said, never heard a gunshot, period. I didn't shoot either of my blanking parents. All right. So he's over at the, he goes to, runs to the neighbor's house with his hands behind his back, supposedly, and goes there and says, something's happening at my house. Please help. Now, supposedly he doesn't know a gun is involved at this point which you would think might be true because if I were his neighbor and heard that there was a gun involved, I don't know that I would go into that house and find anything. You know, I'm like, that sounds dangerous. It was dangerous anyways, a domestic dispute, if it's true. Um, so that neighbor had balls, I'll tell you that. So anyway, the neighbor goes into the house and finds them and th then the police arrive. Um, now, he still got... Madison still has his hands behind his back in handcuffs. Now, one of the biggest things about this whole story is that Madison couldn't have done this because, first of all, it's only 11 minutes and he's got his hands in handcuffs. How could he go and shoot his parents if his hands are in handcuffs and also run to the neighbor's house and tell the neighbor and the neighbor comes back? Or is it more like he says it is. He believes, and 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 many believe that uh, there was an argument that happened. He saw his parents, and you know, fighting. There's some claim that um, the mother has some, like some some uh, DNA from the husband underneath the nails, and that he's got some scratches. Again, I have no access to anything that I can prove this. So, was there a fight going on in the master bedroom? He 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 busted down the door. That dad's got mom like this. And he's like, oh, crap. Um, he's got his hands in handcuffs. He thinks he cannot help. So he runs to the neighbor's house to get help. And by the time they get back, the father has accessed a weapon and shot his wife and himself. Perfectly reasonable story. Um, except for a couple of things. And this is what I have to get into. So one is that there was no evidence that the, the door was broken down. But again, I'm not saying that's terribly important. So I'm going to shove that aside because one of the things you want to do when you're analyzing evidence is, first of all, I don't have any pictures of the door. I don't know that it couldn't have been just, he could have just like knocked against it and it opened up. Um, I just don't know. Um, he says his father's arm is around mom. And he does show a picture of that. 
which is right arm around mom. Now, so one could say, all right, the kid didn't do it, for God's sakes. And I don't think the police believed it in the beginning. And this becomes an, a, a kind of a messed up issue in this whole story. There's a question of uh, gunshot residue and how much he was examined and when he was examined. I still don't have a clue on that. Um, supposedly he did not have gunshot residue on him, GSR, but I don't know if they tested the parents. I can't get any of this information. I don't know if they didn't test him that day because they didn't suspect him. So the next day, then they tested him. There was also a claim that that particular gun did not give off much of that. So that it just may not have been there. All of that is very vague and I can't analyze it because it's too vague. He didn't, did he have obvious blood all over him? No, he didn't. He didn't have blood spatter on him. So the theory is, if he doesn't have GSR and doesn't have blood spatter, he, and he's got his hands behind his back, for God's sakes, why are we even considering that he could have done anything? Let's be, let's be reasonable. All right. The, what happened, the reason he became a suspect was the, the, um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, where did I put it? Hold on a second. Oh, don't let me lose it. Okay. Hold on a second here. Uh, okay. So, uh, was it this? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, hold on a second. I'm trying to find it. Did I lose it? Oh, no. Um, you know me, I lose everything. How about this? Okay, that was the scrapes on the face. That's not it. Um, I lost it. Okay, the, co the, the medical examiner's report basically said that it was likely a homicide. Why was it likely a homicide? Well... And this became an issue about later when the DA dropped the whole case is because he didn't say it was a homicide. He said it was probably a homicide, essentially. He didn't say 100% it's a homicide. Now, how do you know it's 100% a homicide? Well, let's say a person is shot 10 times from 30 feet away. <laughs> homicide. We're done. We, we, we know it's a homicide. So the medical examiner can put down homicide without even blinking an eye. But people do not understand that a lot of times when they put down the manner of death, they're relying on the police, not their own observations. Now, let us let me talk about two different things, cause of death and manner of death. Cause of death, well, they, the dad was, the mama shot, that, that was definitely a homicide. There was no question about the mom being a homicide, but did the dad kill her or did the son? But the dad, they left a teeny window open for it not being a homicide because theoretically he could have done it himself. The father could have shot himself after he killed his wife. The manner, the cause of death was gunshot wound. There's no question. The father, the father was shot in the head by a gun. Okay. That gun on the floor, he was shot in the head. There's no question about it. The cause of death is gunshot. The manner of death is a little this way. Now, let me explain how manner of death works. Suppose you got a guy who ends up at the bottom of a building and he fell, that, not fell, there is an open window on the 10th floor and his body is <laughs> at the bottom. Cause of death, well, blunt force trauma from him whacking the pavement, right? All right, we know what the cause of death is. What's the manner of death? Well... He could have had an accidental death. He could have been sitting on the window, smoking some weed, went ha 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 and fell out the window and <laughs> fell, got drunk, whatever, fell out the window. That's an accidental death. Or he could have committed, said, oh, I'm done with this world. And he could have jumped out the window. Then we'd have suicide. Or somebody could have pushed his butt out the window and then we have homicide. The medical examiner cannot know from examining the body what which one of the manners of death it is. He has to rely on the, the police investigation to determine what the manner of death is. So sometimes, yes, they absolutely know what the manner of death is. Other times, it comes down to a police investigation. In this case, the, the mother was unquestionable homicide. The father, the problem with that and why the police became suspicious a day later was because when they got the when they saw what how he got shot, then they started questioning. So here's what happened. All right. So 
the father, he was shot. Dad, he was shot in the back of the head. But he was shot here. And the angle came, but I'm going to try to do with this. Okay, I'm trying not to use like real, real, real <laughs> implements. Okay, shot back here and coming out here. Or theoretically, he could have been shot this way and come out this way. Okay, you could shoot down and it'll come out the head. But he was shot on the left side of his head, coming out the top of his head, or this, this way. All right, he is right-handed. Let's say he grabs his wife. Well, that's what's kind of funny to me because, well, the sun sort of goes like this with two hands. I saw another commentator, someone who did storytelling and then decided to be in a, a crime criminal profiler, although they are not, um, say he's right-handed. And they're saying that he put his arm around his wife with the right arm because it's stronger and then used his left hand, which he's not left-handed, with the gun. And then somehow shot her and then shot himself. But he's right-handed. I'm going to tell you, when you put your arm around somebody, when you're arm barring them or you're doing whatever you're doing, like if you work as a bouncer, if you're right-handed, your left hand goes down. Not your right hand does not go around. It's your left arm. And then you, you know, you can use this for extra stuff. Girls, if you ever remember, well, I, I don't even boys do, but you know, walking home from school, I always carried my books in the left hand. The weight was on here. My right hand was free. Th there's a way you do things when you're left-handed, right-handed. Now they're trying to claim you might be ambidextrous, but you know, that's pushing luck here. But anyway, generally speaking, he would grab his wife this way and shoot her, which does kind of match. She had a wound through her hand and then she was shot in the head, his right hand. And if he did, if he did that, he could have done that. That's possible. But then their claim is that after he did that, he then switched hands and then turned the gun upside down because it wouldn't even work this way. Turned the gun upside down to shoot himself in the back of the head. Who does that? <laughs> Who does that? Now, it's kind of funny because you see the sheriff, the sheriff tries to describe this in, in the shows. Um, let's see where is the sheriff is. This is a sheriff. This is Sheriff Bill Franklin. He's describing this. He's like, so then you're saying that he placed it upside down and then you had to angle it at this funny, strange angle, right? Um, oh, sorry. Um, strange, this strange angle, right? And then the defense guy says, oh, this actually was a, this I think in one of the shows was a ex-FBI uh, agent, not a profile, but an agent. He's saying, well, it's not impossible, is it? No, it's not impossible. You can do it. He could have shot his wife, changed hands, and done this. But why? <laughs> Who does that? Because theoretically, if you've got your gun in your right hand, that's your two choices. I have never seen, and neither did the sheriff, see anybody put it in their left hand, change it upside down, and do, what the heck? That's a, that's a whole lot of uh, stuff <laughs> that is not necessary. Okay. And why would you do that? The only reason you could even think of doing that is because you wanted to pin the blame for the, for the murder of both of you on him. So, okay. So now do we have a devious father who in those 11 minutes, he calls the sheriff over. He wants to kill his wife. And mind you, um, there, there, he had left some information around and, and, and it isn't, it is, is, is concerning. I'll, I'll say that. So, Let's let's be fair um, about they found a book. And in this book, this is one of the def very strong defense things. First of all, in his system, he had hydrocone, hydrocodone, he had oxycodone and uh, tramadol. Not huge amounts. and He was acting very normally. So I don't know that this was causing him any trouble, although that was in his autopsy. That's the father. He left. He had this book. And in these books, he had read, written certain things that looked like he was Kind of done with life, shall we say. And um, this was one of the things he had written. April, I love you more than you will ever know. Remember, she was on to a new relationship. I just can't go on knowing you are with somebody else. I know you will say I'm being selfish, but it is either me or the both of us. Um, the, the boys need you. You are a great mother 
I'm sorry. Um, I treated you like I did. I love you. Now, this is not an indication of murder-suicide It's because it, he's taking away the, the suicide part to just a murder part. I'm sorry, taking away the murder part, just a suicide part. He's, okay. he's not, he's saying, I, I could get rid of both of us, but then what would the boys do? So no, you're a good mother. So I'm not going to do that. I just need to take myself out of the picture. Now, this was written at some point. We have no information because the documentaries never want to tell us the truth when this was even written, this, this little book. It had a bunch of different things he'd written in it, like he was depressed. People sometimes write things when they're depressed doesn't mean they're exactly going to enact it at that point in time. Uh, it's thoughts that are going through the mind. Maybe they're thinking they're going to rip it out one day and send it. Who knows? It wasn't like it was written and set on a table. All right. So we have a depressed man. But if he thinks he needs to leave this earth and leave his wife alone because she's a good mother, why would he kill her? And why would he pin it on his son by making a completely, you know, try to make it look like a homicide as opposed to taking his own life? Why would he do that? Now, mind you, he has already called. And this is very important to me. Look at what the, some of these statements are. All right. Mike and April Holton followed the depth. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. I want to go to this one first. Hold on a second. Uh, okay. I'm trying to find where it is here. Okay. Um, oh shoot. It's not here. Um, where'd I go? Um, sorry. I'm missing, I'm missing the part here. Uh, let me go for that must maybe it's further down on this this list um all right here we go let's see if this is it all right district oh okay well gotta find it oh i just clicked on something i shouldn't have clicked on but this is very important uh when the two parents had the sheriff the deputy sheriff called the sheriff department had the deputy come hold on a second i'm having a i'm having internet issues here a second okay let me see here. Um, I want to I want to read this one part um, because I think it's very important as to what the intention was or why they called, especially why Michael um, Michael Holton called them to the location. All right, let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, Where'd it go? Um, oh, here we go. All right. After he threw the house party, the deputy came over at the dad's request. And they said, okay, they were all in the room. Remember this. Michael asked the deputy how, as parents, he could get the juvenile courts involved. And he said that um, that he couldn't, it wasn't going to do anything about it that day, but that the following day, they were to go to court and talk to the judge. So they, they agreed to that. Now, you would think that the father is concerned that his son be okay. He's already doing tough love. He's handcuffed his son, calling out the department, uh, the deputy's place, the, the sheriff's department, and saying, look, I can't, the prop, my son is a mess. What do I do? And they said, well, tomorrow, go fill out the paperwork. And they agreed to that, mind you. They agreed to that. Now, somebody who agrees to doing all that, it seems a little odd that then they then go in the house. The guy goes then in the house, kills his wife, kills himself, but makes sure that his son looks like he did it. So his son can go down forever. Why would he do that when he's trying to save his son? That makes zero sense. Absolutely zero sense. So could, was he depressed? Yes. Could he have been in the mood to maybe do himself in at some point in time? Yes. But if that were just basic truth, why didn't he just kill his wife? and kill himself. Why would he do a twisty thing? Put the, why would he do all that and implicate his own son who he was trying to save that very day? It makes zero sense. So I don't believe that for a minute. And this is what happened with the police. They also said, well, this, we can't understand him switching hands and turning a gun upside down and trying to do, that makes no sense. It's more likely somebody else shot him in the back of the head. That's why it was ruled a homicide or a theoretical homicide because now they didn't know whether that same person who shot him in the back of the head also shot the wife. But the question is, did, did he, did for some reason the, the father go nuts on the wife and kill her, kill her. And then the guy, whoever the son came in and grabbed the gun out of his hand and shot his dad. That was one theory. And the other theory is no, the son just shot both of them. Now, 
Let's go to, let me look at your comments and I'm going to go to, could the son have actually killed both of them? Was it physically possible? Was it even feasible? 11 minutes. And he was in handcuffs. Could it have even happened? And so I'll go to your comments, which are like 700,000 before I go on. All right. So let's say, um, this is not, somebody's talking about serial killers. This is not a serial killer case. This is, this is a, this is a, a one-time possible po couple possibilities. One is a family annihilation of one sort or the other when it come right down to it. Um, uh, the three jugs are not necessarily a lot, depending on how much was in a system. Apparently not enough that anybody saw anything affecting him. Um, but again, we don't know how much it was and we don't know how much left over it was. I'm not saying it didn't have in a system. I just don't know. Um, but the, the the gun thing is the, is the problem. The, the twisted left hand instead of right hand gun thing is the problem. That that is 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 a, is an issue. Um, so okay, did the kid ever change his story? In theory, no. And th that was that was one of the things people believed he was telling the truth because he didn't he didn't seem to change up his story. But let me go through. Uh, I'll go. Uh, you can you can decide on the, at the end whether you think he's guilty or not. But here, let's let's start with the handcuff issue. Okay. So one of the problems people have is he was ha his hands were handcuffed behind his back, and when he ran to the neighbor's house, his handcuffs were hand behind, were, were behind his back. Now, and so you say, well, if his hands hands were cuffed behind his back, he couldn't have done the crime. All right. Um, Oh, this, oh, that's what I was looking for <laughs> when I went, okay, <laughs> this is the gun, but here, here in the, uh, where autopsy, uh, the report from the medical exam said the recommended manner of death is, is homicide. And it was the recommended, which apparently the DA then hung his hat on later on and said, well, it didn't say it was, it was absolutely homicide, leaving open the possibility it was not. But again, the medical examiner couldn't, couldn't make that determination. I don't believe in this particular case. Uh, just one of those things you, you they, you know, yeah, they'd have to have a certain level of proof to say it, the manner of death was homicide. Um, okay. So, all right. So let me go, let me go to here for now. Okay. So anyway, he said he had his hands behind his back. And, and if you look at this, his statement, I believe that part of the statement is accurate. Um, let's see if we can get this here. here. Dad's holding mom like that. I had my handcuffs on, all right? And I sprinted all the way to my neighbor's house. And I got there, I went into the house uh, and they found, every, okay, the neighbor went back, found everything. He never heard a gunshot, okay? That was one of the major issues um, that they had. So when, they, when the police got there, they saw two people lying in the bedroom and a gun between them. He never heard a gunshot. They did tests that if... The, no gun had been fired when he was running out of the house and running down to his neighbor's house. Could he hear the gunshots? And it was so flipping loud that he would have heard that all the way to the doorstep of the, of the um, neighbor's house. The only reason way somebody wouldn't hear it is maybe if they were inside a house and had a door closed, but they couldn't understand how he didn't hear any gunshots. And he stood by, I didn't hear any gunshots. I never heard one. And yet it would be hard not to have heard the two gunshots. So that was one thing that got them kind of flipped out. Now, there was this other comment. I, I just want to bring up this comment because I thought it was kind of a funny comment. Um, let's see if I can find it here. Okay. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, well, is it over here? Um, oh, uh, this is one. This is the guy named Brulard. Uh, his name is, um, he's, he, I think he was the guy that showed up at the scene. Uh, and this is a testimony. I want to point out that this is a testimony. Uh, not just somebody just making up a, something to the uh, media. Brulard, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, told Grogan, Goggins, whoever that is, that Madison Holden went next door to his neighbors to report his parents were fighting. The neighbor went to the home and found Mike and April Holton in the master bedrooms, both suffering from gunshot wounds. While the neighbor was in the Holton home, Madison Holton was smoking a cigarette at the neighbor's home. What? <laughs> now, I can't verify this, but my first thought is, how do you smoke a cigarette if your hands are behind your back? And where did you get the cigarette? Who lit the cigarette? Because I'm thinking if your parents are, you're worried, your neighbor's going to run to your parents' house, 
where does a cigarette come from and all that stuff. I don't know the veracity of this report, but it's, in, it's, it's out there and I just don't know if it's how true it is. Supposedly he also had a couple of cell phones in his pocket, which were also interesting. So anyway, let's get to the issue of he had his hands behind his back um, in, in handcuffs. People will say, well, that means that he couldn't have done it because his, he was handcuffed. And the answer to that is, that is not true. There are three ways, basic three ways to get out of a handcuff. Now, if you go on uh, YouTube, first one I saw on YouTube, but the girl had her hand behind her back and she was able to lift her hands up over her head. I'm not kidding you. And go like this and come out in front. It was amazing. <laughs> um she must have been double jointed. I mean, that 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 I'm pretty sure is not how he could have ever moved his hands to the front from the back. So he would have them be able to hold the gun. That that just, you know, that's a that's a circus trick. And she was able to do it. So quite amazing. But then a fellow on the internet did another method where he had his hands behind his back, and then he pulled his hands down over his butt, and then he stepped through his hands and brought his hands up in the front. He did that within seconds. Now, I tried that. And apparently my butt is way too big. I could not get past my butt. But thank you, Benny. So Benny sent me a video and he exhibited that exact move in the video. And I was like super impressed. That was just amazing, Benny. I'm like, whoa, not only do you see it on YouTube, but one of our wonderful patrons, Benny, proved it himself. And he did it in seconds. So thank you, Benny, because it shows it can be done. He's a very lanky, thin guy. He could have simply put his lay down. He could do it a couple of ways. You can, you can stand up and put, you know, and Benny did this standing up, but also I've seen people do it. They lay, lay down, they, they, they pull it, pull down, they lay down the floor and they do like this, but they can move their hands from front to from back to front in seconds. All right. That shows that yes, he could have had his hands available to hold a gun. All right. However, there's a third way. And the third way is quite interesting to me because it seems to be a pretty reasonable way of him being able to do this. And this is this. The key to the handcuffs was sitting on a table in the living room near where Madison was sitting on the couch. He could easily have backed up to it, picked up the pick, pick it up in your one hand and you just now you, now I looked, I, I questioned, how easy is it if I got, if I have my hands behind my back and I picked up that, that key, how easy would it be for me to maneuver behind my back and open up the handcuffs? Apparently from what I see within under a minute with a whole bunch of people, it's not that hard to open your handcuffs behind your back when you have a key. So could he have done that? Yes. He could have either done the, the Benny method uh, or he could have done the key method. Either way, he had opportunity to be able to put the, the either take the handcuffs, open them completely, at least, you know, or at least bring them to the front where he's able to, to handle a weapon. So that means, so the fact he's in handcuffs doesn't mean anything. And if he, he if his hands were uh, able to move around and, and, and shoot people, then when at, that's done, there's no reason why he then can't put his hands behind his back and re reattach the other handcuff and then run to his neighbor's house and look like he, you know, his hands are behind his back. He could also just, the other thing is he could just be pretending, you know, but he, it, it's very, very doable. So the handcuff thing you can throw out, he could have gotten out of the handcuffs in order to be able to handle a weapon. Absolutely. 100% true. So that 11 minutes that people say, Oh, I couldn't have done it because he was in handcuffs is not accurate. He could, all right? Not that he did, but he could. Now, the next thing is, does he know where there's a gun? Let's say, let's say that his dad, let's say his dad wasn't shooting anybody. Could he access a gun in his dad's house? Apparently his dad is kind of um, careless. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, sprinted to the, all right, let's see where the thing is here. Okay, I have to, I, okay, never heard the gunshot. Where's the thing about the gun? Okay. Hold on, I gotta figure out where it went to. Uh, maybe here. Okay, hold on. Yeah, there was a gun safe in his closet, he says, but then he says this. 
And he always has a nine millimeter pistol on his bed table beside his bed. So there is an accessible weapon to Madison right there. So yes, he can, he can get the handcuffs off or at least open them up. He has access to a weapon, which is likely loaded. Because when you leave a gun on your bedside table, you don't leave it without the bullets in it. Because that's the whole point. Is that it's a weapon. He lives with his dad. He knows exactly where everything is. Now, we're talking about 11 minutes again. When could this have happened if he was involved? Well, this is something that I find absolutely fascinating, which I think a lot of people overlook. Um, let's see if I can find it in this thing again. All right. Uh, hold on a second. Shoot. I think I keep, I thought I had put this out here and I keep, I keep losing it. Um, oh, yeah, no, no. Here it is at the top. Sorry, I found it. Mike and April Holton followed the deputy to his patrol car parked outside when the call was completed. Okay, get this straight. So Madison's on the sofa. Mom and dad talk to the deputy inside. Then they follow the deputy to the car. Now, I don't know the exact timing. How long did it take them to follow the deputy to the car? What conversation did they have outside at the car, which may be about going to the judge the next day and so on and so forth. All right. So they followed the deputy park to the, his patrol car parked outside when the call was completed. Brulard said, oh, that's what he said. Okay. Franklin Okay, I'm getting a little confused here. Franklin left the home at 4.48 p.m. Some 11 minutes later, at 4.59, the second 911 call came in from the neighbor's home about trouble at the Holton home. Okay, so there was 11 minutes from the time the call was completed and he left the home. And then 11 minutes later, the neighbor called and said there was trouble at the Holton home. All right. While the parents are walking out to the car, this gives Matt Madison a reasonable amount of time to take the key, open up his handcuffs, or to do the Benny trick and come up with his hands in front. He knows where the gun is at. He can easily access the gun. By the time his parents come back in, that end of the phone call, I mean, sorry, the end of when the call from the department ends before the 11 minutes begins. He is already without handcuffs and a gun in his hands. I'm pretty sure that he can shoot his parents down in just seconds, wipe the gun off, chuck it on the floor and put the handcuffs back behind his back and run down to the neighbor's house in 11 minutes. The 11 minutes is meaningless. Either the father could have killed the mother and himself in the 11 minutes or Madison could have done the exact same thing. So the 11 minutes is not important and neither are the handcuffs. The real question is who did what? Uh, but all had access to the gun. And let's look at, let's look at some of the, so we are, and we know the father's got some issues and depression issues, uh, but he also seems to want to get his son help and he's going to go to the judge the next day. So it makes very little sense to me that after he plans to do that, he runs into the back room with his wife and they, they have a fight where he grabs his gun and kills her and then kills himself and sets up his son because he's doing it in such a weird way that's making his son look like he did it. This to me is a very, very unusual kind of, that I, I can't see that quite happening. Now, I want to look at a couple other things here about the behavior and the reason they suspected him. Now, I don't know about the cigarette thing. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm like, where, I don't know if that's true or not, but if it were true, it's a little bit odd, but okay, let's, let's let that one go. Let's see what else that he has to say. The, the sheriff said one of the reasons they suspected him is he never seemed to be grieving his parents or worried about his parents. He was more concerned as he, the sheriff says about missing homecoming. So here you have a guy whose parent, both parents had just died and he's concerned about homecoming. Now you say, maybe that's just the, the sheriff talking crap. He said he doesn't see the emotion in the kid. So he's just making this stuff up. Well, okay. So I went on to Twitter and I found his site, Jesse Madison Holton. 
Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Don't hate, appreciate fishing and baseball sports. He joined in 2013. Okay, that's him. So it's not not him. This is this is a tweet he made, which I thought was fascinating. So my mom won't let me go to the homecoming game. Now that was uh two, three, fourteen. When when did all this go down? Um, I'm trying, let me go back to the actual time frame of this thing. So this was this was actually in 14. This was like two years prior. But his mom had thrown him out of the house. His dad was pissed off at him. This was a kid who was not happy with either one of his parents, nor did he have a great respect for either one of his parents. I can see that he was more concerned about going to home, homecoming than the death of his parents because he even said, sort of says it there, right? So that's problematic. Now we hear, now we see this. Here he is in, here he is in jail. So he says, like, what have uh, like all the girls said about it? Like, like that's what I'm wondering. Uh, like, oh, damn, I blanked a murderer. That's kind of creepy. So he's in there having fun talking about how he could be a murderer that killed his parents, that girls want to have sex with him. It's a little off. And apparently this is this this is one of the things when I, when I, when detectives do their jobs, they do pay attention to reactions. And yes, everybody doesn't react the same. But they saw this guy as having zero any kind of empathy for his parents, any kind of sadness. He claims later that, well, I just, you know, I just, I had so much going on, I couldn't even think about it. Okay, it's a good excuse. And I say, when you look at some of these documentaries and he speaks, you can sort of, you know, it seems really nice. So you think, well, maybe that's true. Um, let me see if there's something else here. Um, he did say, now this is another thing I don't know is true. He said he wanted a polygraph test and they and then it's claimed that the police never gave him that. Now, I don't know, again, here's one of these things. I don't know the accuracy of that at all. Let me see what else I have here. Um, okay, that's the gun safe stuff. Let's see. Um, uh, what's this? Um, oh, oh, that's what I was talking about before. Um, when when they went out to the car, this is this is what happened. He was the 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 Mike Mike the father was very inquisitive. He wanted to know what he could do for his son. Paperwork that he could get his child in front of a judge, or he could talk to the judge about the problems that he was experiencing with a child. So again, the parent, the father seems like he's looking forward to tomorrow, what he can do to help his son. So I, it seems odd that he would then go and kill, kill his wife and himself when he's trying to help his son or that he'd set his son up for a murder charge. That I, 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 I have problems with that. I, I can't see that. Um, so, so what I end up with in the long run here is, um, this, the handcuffs are meaningless and the 11, the 11 minutes are meaningless. What is most meaningful is how he got shot in a, in a position from which a left, uh, makes no sense that a right-handed person would switch the guns and do that. It makes more sense that somebody who ever had the gun just simply shot him and shot him because he's behind him. Oh, I'm sorry. The guy's behind him. He just shoots him and he can shoot him with his right hand. doesn't matter because he's behind him. Um, Madison certainly had odd behaviors at the time extremely odd behaviors. And, and I, I wasn't there to read, see everything that went on the psychiatric reports and all that stuff, if they even did them. But um, I see where they said it's a, you know, that essentially it's probably a homicide and they left this space for, could it be something else? And the fact is they didn't, may not have had the absolute amount of proof they wanted to have to, because the DA wants to win. And the DA thinks, man, I could just get myself in trouble here. I'm not going to win the case. He may just dump it because he doesn't want to take the chance or the money that this town would have to pay out. Doesn't mean he didn't think 90% that he was probably guilty of maybe shooting both of them, which would be much more likely than he shot his dad in retaliation for the dad shooting the mom. It just seems a little bit sketchy. Um, so I think the sheriff, I think the DA believe that he's likely guilty that he simply got out of the handcuffs and when his parents walked back in, he had the gun and I don't know exactly how it went down there and he did what he did. And the blood spatter was just, he was just fortunate. Um, the GSR, I don't know what they, they said it was very minimal with that gun. And I don't know when they actually tested it, whether well, they had time and he did have time. He had 11 minutes. All he needed was a minute when they walked back in 
and he could wipe off the gun. He could wash up. Well, I don't know what the heck he did. And then run down the street. He had, he had a good eight, nine minutes. Now one could say, well, it's just a kid. He wouldn't know what he's doing. I don't know. I don't know what he watches for shows. <laughs> you know, he might've watched enough detector shows to know some basics. Maybe he just got lucky, but is it more likely that he was guilty of shooting his parents than he's not? Yes, it's more likely. If I were the DA and I didn't have the GSR and the blood spatter, even though it was so weird, could you, could, would it, that defense attorney is like, well, he could have done it. Well, he could have. Doesn't mean he did. It's unlikely that he did. But because that old could have, could have done something, often gives reasonable doubt to a jury. And they'll go, well, he could have. So therefore, I don't want to put a 17-year-old kid away in prison for the rest of his life when dad could have done it. I don't think dad did do that. But I see where the, I see where the DA was coming from. I see what he thought the jury might think. Um that there simply wasn't enough solid, solid evidence to prove this without a reasonable doubt. Um, so that's where I stand on this. Um, and this, to me, is the key to the case. And the rest of the stuff is not as important as people make it out to be. Now I'll check your, I'll check your comments. All right. <laughs> All right. Where are we at here? Um, yes, he can step in and out of those cuffs. And that's what Benny showed. It was just so cool because I'd seen it on YouTube. But, you know, it's YouTube. So somebody somebody could have practiced it on YouTube like 50, 100 times. But Benny did it just like that. It was amazing. And it was cool to see somebody who was not a YouTuber proving the point. So Benny, Benny, who believes that he's most likely did kill his parents. Uh, yes, I thought you I thought you uh, had a pretty good um, analysis. <laughs> I did indeed. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, Okay, uh, Matt Midgey says, shooting his father after seeing his father shoot his mother would be justifiable homicide due to self-defense, wouldn't it? Yes, it would indeed. That's why I find that particular permutation hard to believe. Yeah, that it would seem that he could easily say, I saw my dad kill my mom and I killed, I, 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 I grabbed the gun from him and killed him. Now, theoretically, he could be scared that even if he said that, he'd go to prison and be accused of killing both. So is it, I don't know. I guess I, I would be in the middle on that one because you don't know in those circumstances what you might want to lie about because you don't trust the system. And the, I, I, the system did arrest him, right? So yeah, at some point, um, you can muffle sounds. Well, he the, if, if dad was shooting mom and himself, they, they, he wasn't muffling anything. There was no muffling going on. So he should have heard both of those gunshots go off except he might be just telling, lying about it. He did hear them, but he's just saying he didn't. I don't know why he would say he didn't hear them because if he's running away from the house and they're being shot, the shooting is going on while he's running away, but it's so loud he could hear them. It's odd that he didn't just say, I heard them shoot. I was half, I was all the way to the uh, neighbor's house. I heard the shot, got, gunshots go off. I don't know why he didn't say that. If, if he's innocent or if he's guilty, I don't know why he didn't say that. Except for... except for if he were involved and it shot both of them, then his memory of running away from the house, he just, that stuck in his head and he, and he didn't lie properly about it. I, I you know, it's one of those things. It's hard. To, it's hard to say. Um, let's see. Um, I did not, I did not hear the 911 call. You found the 911 call. I did not. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> You know, sometimes when you, I don't remember it was in either one of the documentaries. Where did you, where did you find the 911 gun call? Did you Google that or YouTube it? I, I didn't, I didn't come across it um, at all. Um, oh, not a released one. Not that I know of, but, you know, again, if I were writing a book or doing a, a, a big, huge thing where I was going to spend five, 5,000 hours on this case, I might have every detail and know for sure. But, you know, this is a, <laughs> YouTube show. And I, sometimes I do miss things. Um, uh, I haven't seen any 911. I haven't seen any transcript of a 911 tape or I say autopsy reports, police reports, interviews, except for that little bit of interviewing, which they show from the actual interview with him, with the police. They do show that I only parts of it, but they showed at least some of that. So it's the only thing I can really see. Um, let's say, um, 
Well, that's interesting. I've seen Letitia Stouch slip handcuffs, and she means <laughs> thick to be nice toward her. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I didn't, I didn't manage it, but you know, my time, my butt is way too big. It's like, uh, uh, <laughs> see, we're in the same place, everybody. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, <laughs> no, okay. No, Benny didn't have hand. Oh, I should. I gotta save Benny now. Oh my God, Benny did not have handcuffs. He he would just wrap some um he wrapped some materials around his hand behind his back just so he could show make sure he had something around his hands that were not moving. <laughs> no, Benny didn't show any handcuffs. Ooh, I ruined your reputation, Benny. No, he just used some he just used some uh, material. So he he did not have that. <laughs> Benny will never forgive me. <laughs> Yes, Benny is a rock star. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, okay. This is um, this is a good question, Sky Ricky. What is the method parents use to allow you to handcuff a teenager on drugs? Why would Madison just allow that if he's a violent killer? Well, that's a good question. And this is, again, I, I well, we can't interview the dad because he's dead. We could ask Madison about that, but whether he'll tell the truth or not, I don't know. But I don't, I wish they had asked that question because I would like to know that myself. It's like, did he's like, his dad just said, give me your hands and I'm going to handcuff you. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming he's doing that to show Madison what it's like that you could be going to prison for, you know, for drug stuff. You're going to get, eventually get, caught for uh, drug dealing or drug use, you're going to end up in jail or prison. And this is what it'll feel like. I think it was a, that scared straight tough love thing. Um, how easy was it for him to put the cuffs around him? I don't know. Did he know the cuffs were there? Um, why did he have them? Do I approve of it? I'm not saying I do. Supposedly they'd gotten desperate. They, they, they couldn't seem to control this kid. He was out of control. Um, so I don't have an answer for that, but it doesn't mean that, you know, yes, you would think, okay, so let's say dad were trying to put the cuffs on him. Wouldn't he at that moment turn around and fight with his dad? I don't know. Maybe his dad's pretty tough. I don't know. Maybe at that point he was shocked. Maybe his dad snuck up on him. I really don't know. But I do know that when the parents left the house, he had ample time to unlock those, un unlock those, um, those cuffs. He might have even had the cuffs already unlocked when the parents left the house. Just because the parents are talking to the, the cop, they might be just distracted and he's already gone like, eh, you know, <laughs> and he's already ready. So I, I don't know. But all I'm saying is the 11, the 11 minutes is ample enough for anything to happen. And the handcuffs were easily removed enough to be able to commit the crime. So those two things are just irrelevant. And but they're being used as, oh, my God, this couldn't happen. The kid was handcuffed. And it was only 11 minutes. No, those things weren't really important. Um, so, so supposedly in the drawer, the son said at this point on top of the thing, I, he lives with him, so I don't know what the truth is there. Um, okay, here's another point. Dad could have unlocked him after the police left. This is possible. Or mom could have done it and dad could have gotten mad at her. I, I, I wanted to go into this, this possibility. Yes, it's possible that they said, okay, he's gone now. We'll let you out of the handcuffs. And then things went badly. That's also possible. So you see, there's all these different scenarios, but we'll never know. Um, we'll never know. Uh, oh, that's probably true. The father was not going to keep the kid handcuffed until morning. Dad could have uncuffed him. The kid can kill the parents and then recuff himself. Yes. Or mom could have done it. it. We just don't know. We absolutely do not know. But regardless, the fact that he was not, could have gotten out of the handcuffs, whether he was, un, whether somebody else unlocked him or he unlocked himself or pulled or pu just got his hands in front of him. Either way, he could have, ac he could access the gun and then use the gun. He could. So that that's not something that prevents him from being able to commit a crime. Um, let's see. Uh, Yeah, homecoming's a big thing to a teen. So some teens and prom too, although I never went to my prom. 
I was very unpopular. What can I say? I never expected to go to homecoming or the prom. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, uh, sad but true. <laughs> what was that? I've, I, can't, I never can remember that. Uh, the, my, my little poem I wrote and was like, high school reunion. I don't care. Hardly remember being there. Yearbook pages, specious land, never, t yearbook pages, never touch, yearbook pages, empty land, never touched by specious hands, uh, missed the prom, no, had no dates, had, missed the prom, had no dates, something to, oh, I forgot my whole poem. I, it was a really cute poem, no, no ex loves to castigate. Well, high school reunion, I don't care, hardly remember being there, something like that. I have it written down somewhere, but I was unpopular. So those weren't important to me, but to most teenagers, extremely extremely important definitely uh they meant they meant something um mad at mommy i don't know who's whose handwriting uh, supposedly no that was that was supposedly the father's handwriting he was writing to his mother um and then to his wife and uh again i don't know much details about that i don't know how long they were written there uh, although the the thing about his wife moving on that was fairly recent so that was something that was definitely going on in the father's brain at that time <laughs> I ran a floating poker game and I hated high school. I just, I, 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 I was bored out of my mind and it was very snobby high school and I wasn't very good at being snobby. So yeah, I just, I left it. I, I graduated a year early and just got the heck out of there. I, ha I don't have good memories at all. And I've never gone to a high school reunion, but I know many people did have good time in their high schools and enjoyed being part of the whole high school thing. It's just not me. <laughs> <laughs> I was a different. <laughs> we all have these, you know, amazingly different experiences, um, just depending on where we lived and, you know, what happened in the schools we were in and what our families were like. It's just, you know, um, I can remember my poem. That's really annoying me now. Ow, darn it all. I can't remember it. It was such a cute, cute one too. <laughs> um, Oh, look at you. Oh, high school athlete. Oh, at least you got to be an athlete and be a soccer player. Lucky you. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> no. Lots of people hated high school. And some of us, you know, they, they claimed he was bullied in younger years, but then he sprouted and he was tall and he had lots of friends and they said they can't believe he did it. And, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the uh, investigation discovery documentary, it seems very nice. I mean, he's very likable. And so part of me looks at that and wants to say, hey, this guy didn't do it. I hope he has a great life. Uh, but I was when I watched the other documentary, I was a little bit more creeped out. So and then I look back and say, just because he's learned how to behave in public doesn't mean he wasn't what he was at the time and doesn't mean he necessarily is a different personality today. It just he may be able to handle it better. So it's one of these things you just don't know. But as far as the case goes. I think the sheriff had good reason to believe that he committed the crime. And the DA may have had good reason to decide not to take it to court as it goes like that. So, yeah. Having immature parents can make you act out. Well, you know, anytime your family, you know, supposedly the family was really a happy family for so long and then it fell apart. Um, and I think for any teenage kid, when they have family, parents fighting and then parents breaking up and going to different houses and sharing the kids. It's not a good thing. It's a, it's a tough time. And you know, luckily most, a lot of kids survive it in spite of everything because they do, but then some kids don't do so well with it, you know, and there's a lot of anger and a lot of, you know, um, I feel like they've been betrayed their life. You know, when you're a kid, you don't have any choices. You know, when your, when your parents decide to, 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 to quit on their marriage and walk away and then throw you in different houses and fight with each other. You, you don't, you don't control any of that. So it, it's, it's kind of a cruel situation for, for children. And, um, you know, parents can do the best to alleviate as much as they possibly can, but it's, it's rough. It really is rough. And I, you know, I certainly feel for this kid, you know, for what he was going through. And, and yes, maybe it's hard to say that he just didn't start doing drugs and stuff like that just because it was a relief. 
doesn't mean he killed his parents. But there are some issues, <laughs> which if you're investigating this case, make you say, but then maybe again he did. Maybe he did. Um, yeah, that's true, too. That's an interesting point. The teen years can also be trying on the family and marriage. Yes, that is also true because, you know, if you're already having certain issues and then the kids, they're, they're causing trouble themselves, especially if a child happens to have a, a psychopathic personality. I, I, there's families that have really suffered because that kid is so difficult to deal with. And I'm not saying he's psychopathic. I'm just saying some families have that in their family and they have this kid who's they can't trust that lies, that manipulates. And it, and sometimes it, that person, that person, a psychopath, will manipulate the parents against each other on top of it. So therefore, he, just, he helps destroy the parents' relationships. So that's another whole, that's another whole major issue. Um, he did, there was a cop, uh, one, uh, one uncle was a copy. To, it was in, actually the, the, the sheriff let him, the, when they were doing the interviewing, they actually let the, the uncle sit in and the uncle wasn't too sure about whether he was guilty or not. So he said, hey, tell the truth because you can't change it later because then you'll look back. Uh, so he had uh, some good coaching uh, from the, the uncle. What's interesting is that his two brothers aren't in either documentary. And I don't know why. It could be they just don't want to be in a stupid documentary. It could be because they didn't want to say what they had to say. Maybe they think he's guilty. Um, the mother's family tends is on his side, um, thinks that he's not guilty, but I think they want to blame a lot of things on him and say it's his fault that she ended up dead. Uh, and his side of the family tends to blame him. And, and that could be because they either didn't like him or see something's wrong with him or because they don't want, they don't want their, their family member to be blamed for, for her murder. So everybody's got their, again, own agenda. They got little agendas here and there and everywhere, you know? <laughs> so, um, but I think this case will never see the inside of a court again. I think he, he's free forever. Um, I hope, I hope that the part of the, the personality I saw in the second documentary um, where he's a likable fellow, um, I hope, there he is, I hope, he didn't commit the crime. I hope that he is a decent human being. I hope that his marriage is good and that he does good things with his life. He says he wants to become a defense attorney and help people like himself. When he's joined the army. I don't know what's going on there. Um, I don't know this all, uh, whether everything he says is just um, him manipulating and, and playing everybody or whether it's truly him. I can't honestly say. Um, so a lot of times when people do the behavioral things or do statement analysis, I can't catch a lot in his statements that make me absolutely think he's lying about things or he's highly deceptive, but I'm having, I, I continually have problems with the fact that the father seemed to want the next day to come so he could help his son. And that it seems like a very short period of time for him to get into that much of a confrontation with his wife, with his son sitting there in the room, that he'd kill her and kill himself. It just seems a little fast for that to go down um, when he wants to help his son the next day. And two, I, I have a problem with that. And that's the thing that sticks out most. And that's a piece of solid physical evidence. Um, and he did have the time and he was angry at both parents. And he knew he would be going to court the next day and not going to homecoming. So he had motive. If you talk about motive, he had the motive, which was eliminate my parents. I'm free from both of them and all their drama. I can go do what I want. So I think he's got motive. He's got the ability. He's got the time frame. And this looks like a homicide, not a suicide. But I think the DA had some issues trying to prove that. And that's why he walked away from it. I say, who knows? Maybe, maybe he didn't do it. And, and, you know, I can't say that he did, but if I had to pick, I'd lean toward this being a homicide, a, a double homicide. So, um, 
any other quick comments before I uh, wrap this up and go eat my dinner? Let's see. Um, uh, Uh, well, this is true. Most of us have issues, but most of us don't go around killing our parents. No. I mean, generally speaking, you have to have a level of psychopathy to do those kind of things. There, there are moments when people who murder are not psychopaths. And that usually is like they find somebody of more self-defense type of thing. Somebody's attacking their child, that kind of stuff. But when you get people do things where that is the, that is the answer to their dilemma, a husband who kills his wife, a wife who kills her husband, um, a person who kills their friend because they're miffed at them because they're being dumped. That's a level of psychopathy. That's, just, that's you know, most of us, we, 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 we've had relationships end and we walk away without killing the other person. We're not happy. <laughs> you know, we, there are things we will do, scream, yell, be mean, <laughs> levels of things we will do. But the level where you cross the line to take somebody's life is pretty major. That's just not, that's not normal. <laughs> that's not normal. And I know a lot of times people will try to play all that down. It's not normal. That's not what that, no, that's psychopathy. And I don't know if that's the case here, but anyway, let me, let me wrap it up for tonight. Um, and uh, I'll be back with a hangout uh, probably on Thursday. And I've got your suggestions for the, you know, a lot of you sent a suggestion for which show I was going to do today. And I've got them on the list now. So I will certainly be probably getting to a number of your other suggestions. But I thought this one was truly interesting. So, yeah. Anyway, that's it for today. And um, if you're new to the channel, again, please do like and subscribe. And if I get demonetized, please do support the channel in any way. <laughs> I hope I don't get demonetized, but, you know, sometimes when there's certain, the, the people, the, what do they call it? People, uh, uh, what, what is this stupid, you can't, you can't say the S word anymore. They unalived themselves and stuff that sometimes that's a big no, no for YouTube. So, uh, so this might be demonetized, but who knows? <laughs> oh, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I appreciate that, Lisa. And thank you for everybody else. So, um, oh, where can you, uh, well, first of all, you're already my patron. So you, you've already, you're already contributing every month, which I truly appreciate because that gives a, that gives a good solid, um, support for the channel, but there's that little dollar sign below. People can click on that. Um, that's one way, uh, besides that. And again, people, if you, you know, even the, even subscribing makes a huge difference with the algorithm and the, all that stuff. I don't even understand all the crap. <laughs> I don't. Um, but, um, you know, I, pl I plug along, you know, mostly because I want to keep doing this. And, uh, but, you know, you never know when it comes down to YouTube and they've got these, uh, these things that de de determine stuff. And I, I don't have any hand in that, but, um, but anyway, so anyway, I hope to see you uh, at, the, at the hangout uh, probably on Thursday. And um, and I'll use one of your ideas for next show next week because you all sent them to me. And now I have extra time to look at them. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Bye.